So I was asked by some of my team members, might have been Edgar, if it is, hey Edgar, thanks, uh, to talk about things that I treasure, my most valued possessions. So I'm going to talk about actual possessions. I'm not going to do something dumb like, oh, it's my kids and grandkids. Family is the real friend. That's, yeah, we'll talk about actual physical items. Okay. So some of these are hard to find and out of print. Um, so we're talking about movies I treasure first. Some of these have meaning because of an event or because I viewed it with people that I that I care about. So so we'll start off with my Casa Negra movie. So Casa Negra was a company that came out in the, I think, early 2000s. And they were doing Mexican movies, mostly horror, with really good subtitles. I love that because I'm always interested in Mexican movies. And like Italian movies, you can get with American English subtitles. Spanish movies, you can get with English subtitles. French movies, you can get with English subtitles. Chinese movies come with English subtitles. Mexican movies, not so much. So I loved the Casa Negra was releasing these. And they were releasing them in stellar versions. I loved this. I saw, I got a copy of the Brainiac, which one of my friends says it saved his life. That movie was so great. And uh, not always great in a positive way, but great in terms of being amazing. So Casa Negra sadly went out of business, which is tragic because it was so good. But at least we have some of his movies. Then there is my Edgar Wallace collection. Now, Edgar Wallace was a British author who somehow got more popular in Germany than England. And so Germany started doing lots of movies based on his books. And uh, so I found online this this place in Germany that had all the Edgar Wallace movies. So I failed upon my friend who lived in Switzerland at the time to go to Germany, find this, get it and ship it to me, which he did. And sadly, about a third of the movies don't have English subtitles or dubbing. So that's sad. But the ones I can see are really good. And and I love it. It's also kind of odd that Edgar Wallace is a big hit in Germany because his early movie stories, I've read some in like written in the 1920s and like Germans are outright bad guys because, of course, the Kaiser and his men were the w most unthinkable, terrible person there has ever been. I mean, this is before Stalin starved millions of Ukrainians to death, before Hitler, like, you know, Pol Pot. So he didn't know any better, but, you know, uh, he thought the Kaiser was bad. So Germans are bad. And he, but it's British. So it has like the genteel 1920s British racism where their idea of a race is like a German or a Frenchman, not skin colored so much. So it was weird. Anyway, The Giant Claw. This is a monster movie I'll talk about someday because I love it so much. But I was showing this to my brother, Eric, sadly now passed away. And uh, partway through the movie, The Giant Claw flies into view and Eric was stunned. I had to pause the movie while he stood up and he stomped around his chair yelling at the movie. Uh, how terrible it was. Then he sat down and said, okay, let's watch it. And then he loved it. It was the best movie ever for him. But he always had as a catchphrase after then, nothing could prepare you for The Giant Claw. Then there's this movie. The Whisperer in Darkness. That's my only movie. I get a film credit as the executive producer, so I know exactly what executive producer does, which is nothing. But I had my name on the film, so that was cool. Actually, I do have one of the film credit in it. I'm listed in the credits as one of as like one of the backup brain cases. So brain cylinders, that was neat. Anyway, if you want to see what I think is an excellent Lovecraft movie, and I'm not just praising myself because I didn't do any of that creative work, Whisper in Darkness, check it out. So how about books? William Hope Hodgson has a collection of all his books done by Nightshade Press. Manly Wade Wellman has a collection of all his uh, short stories by Silver John done by Nightshade Press. Clark Ashton Smith has a complete collection by Nightshade Press. Nightshade is, is the bomb, right? Now, Solar Ponds, who is a uh, Sherlock Holmes knockoff by August DeLeth, who's kind of fun to read, has a complete collection from Arkham House. These things usually go in one print run, then they go away. Uh, you know, I think uh, Nightshade might have done a Seabury Quinn collection. So these collections w knock off one-off collections where I can get all of a single author. I really value these. They're hard to replace. So at least I've got these ones. I've missed on some of them, but I got Hodgson, Solar Ponds, Wellman, and Smith. So yay me. Valuable. Um, I also really value my 1914 collection of Lord Dunsany's plays. Lord Dunsany wrote amazing plays, and by and large, they haven't made it into modern reprints. We only see his uh, short stories and novels, but he did plays, and they're great. Also, this book I really, really like. It's called Heroes of the Dark Continent, printed, I think, around 1870. I found this book in my grandpa's library when I was, like, seven, 
and it fascinated me. It's heavily illustrated with amazing stories and events. It has woodcuts everywhere. It talks a lot about the ongoing struggle at the time between the Europeans, who of course were coming in to exploit the Africans. The book doesn't mention that part. It just talks about going in there, right? And the Arabs, who at that time were on trade routes in the interior, exploiting the Africans coming inside. So the natives are kind of trapped between the Europeans coming in from the coast, the Arabs coming in from the interior, but they're both like enslaving the natives. Well, I guess the Europeans in 1870 aren't carrying them away as slaves. They're just enslaving them kind of on the spot, which is, I guess, slightly better, you know? Anyway, meanwhile, the native tribes are fighting or allying with both sides. It's a really exciting, brutal time that um, that would be interesting to uh, have more movies on. Uh, one movie that, that does take place during the time that I quite like, by the way, if you have a chance to see it, is uh, The Naked Prey by uh, Cornell Wilde. It's, uh, it's really good. And it shows some of that terrible stuff going on. Um, now, the image that most impressed me, though, in that book, The Heroes of the Dark Continent, was this one. It's an image of mythical African monsters as a cyclops and a unicorn. I rather like that the cannibals of Africa in this picture are listed correctly as a mythical monster. I mean, there, were, there was real cannibals in the 19th century, but as far as I know, there was none in Africa. Um, African cannibalism had to wait till the 20th century in the rise of the leopard, leopard man cult, which is a whole horror story in itself. Anyway... I went to London bookstores trying to find my own copy of Heroes of the Dark Continent, and I finally found one, and it's pretty great. The illustrations are incredible. I remember one illustration that says, uh, so-and-so's adventure with a Cape Buffalo. And what it shows is a Cape Buffalo flinging the sky in the air, head over heels 10 feet up, and I'm like, that's not a very fun adventure. <laughs> but that was his adventure, you know. Next, on to games that I value, that I love. I have some pretty obscure games. Um, Magic Realm. Um, is a game that was put out by uh, Avalon Hill back in the day. And the idea behind um, Magic Realm was that they said to their designer, D&D &D is good. Do a and d like game. But he'd only never heard board games. I think it was Don Greenwood. So he said, I'll do the best I can. So he made Magic Realm. And Magic the Realm is like the best game designer like pack box ever because you can do so many things that has full of interesting ideas i'm not sure if they all hang together and it's really hard to learn to play but but it has all these cool concepts in it the combat system is unique never seen it before the uh the way the tiles flip over to be enchanted is unique i never saw that before anyway magic realm uh it's really incredible and of course it's out of print so then there's vinci i love vinci i played vinci a lot in the 90s um uh, and uh, then it went out of print and it got replaced with Small World, which is not the same. Sorry, guys. Small World, not as good as Vinci. For one thing, Vinci is historical, which doesn't necessarily make it better. But in this case, I think it does. Um, so Vinci was cool. I'm glad I got my copy of that. I do have Small World, too. So I also have a pretty good collection of old SPI, that Strategy Publications Incorporated, I think is what it means. But it did war games because I was doing war games as a kid I mentioned in another video. And Avalon Hill war games. I have a pretty good collection of these. I have some real period pieces like this SPI game, Fox, Bat, and Phantom. So Fox, Bat, and Phantom has, has altitude and it does it the wackiest way possible. You actually take a counter that says what your altitude is and put it on top of your token. So you have a thing of 30 altitudes you have to lay out from 1 to 30 and move it up and down as you go around. It's weird. Also, it was done before we actually had captured a fox bat. Uh, MiG-25, I think they are. Beca and so we thought at the time, NATO thought the fox bat was like a, was like a super effective air superiority machine that could kill everything. And then we found one. And we go, oh, it's basically a guided missile that shoots down bombers. Um, and it doesn't maneuver at all, so which is why it's not used as a fighter. It's used as a reconnaissance thing now. But... Uh, but we didn't know that, so the fox bat is like the ultimate thing in the game. That's kind of fun. So Avalon Hill. Avalon Hill was a company that was around for a long time, did a lot of old war games. I loved Avalon Hill, played them all. That was the main go-to company for me. They actually tried to offer me a job in the 90s, or the late, early 90s. I didn't take it, probably just as well, because eventually went under. But uh, they were weird. Someday I might tell some Avalon Hill stories, but... Uh Okay. Oh, yeah. My awards are valued. I'm only going to show one of my awards because if I show a bunch of them, you'll say, oh, Sandy, that show off. What an egomaniac. And I am an egomaniac. Game designers are, but I don't want to, I don't want you to think I am. So, I, so I'm going to show one. And my favorite award is my 1990 Gaming Hall of Fame from the Origins Convention. This is back when the Origins Convention was pretty big. Um, it's not as big now. It's fallen on harder times. And this award gaming hall of fame is particularly precious because only one person a year gets it 
and is voted on by fans, not a bunch of industry drones who are smoozing and politicking. It's fans that vote you in, so it's real. So thanks guys for voting me. So those are some things I like that I value. If you like me, push the like button. If you like me a lot, push the subscribe button. I publish every Friday. If you don't want to miss a Friday, sign up for notifications. I don't have a Patreon because I'm a business owner, but check out my Peter Sinking's YouTube channel. See if you want to subscribe to it. Also, check out this awesome thing for sale on the petersongames.com website.